This video will explain evaluating large language models trained on code. This presentation will begin with some quick takeaways about Codex, which is the deep learning with code model, the GPT style model trained on code presented in the paper, uh, some more background on deep learning with code data, other papers like CodeBird, the Codex Glue Challenge, and also the Apps Benchmark that's also mentioned in this paper as well. And then we'll also backtrack a little bit talking about language and sequence modeling, extending these language modeling uh, data sets on say Wikipedia, uh, books, or just like a text web scrape into other domains like now code, we've seen it adapted to images, or say amino acids, all these different ideas of extending this sequence modeling, language modeling idea into other data domains. And then we'll look at the human eval, the benchmark designed by the authors to test the system. I will look at the repeated sampling technique, a way to overcome say uh, beam search or greedy decoding when you can just uh, generate tons of samples and then see what goes through the unit test and then use that as the uh, you know, winning sample, uh, the passive K metric corresponding with repeating sampling, kind of similar to these information retrieval metrics where how many K's do you need to retrieve or how many K's do you need to generate in order to pass the unit test. And then we look at the fine tuning data sets they design from uh, the code forces, uh, competitive programming interview style questions, as well as continuous integration tests from these public GitHub repositories, which are pretty interesting. And then uh, doc string generation. So they reformulate the uh, problem. So instead of going uh, doc string function signature, you know, implementation, it'll go function signature implementation, then doc string. So rearrange the fine tuning data set like that so that the model can then be used to write uh, like natural language explanations of the code in that kind of left to right autoregressive GPT style. I will look at some results and different things they take apart. And then uh, the performance investigation, uh, broader impact list they state, as well as limitations like uh, you know, particularly where the doc string generation fails. So here are some quick takeaways from the paper. They train different scales going from 300 million parameters up to a pretty large 12 billion parameter model. It's a massive model. It's about the size of the T5 model. It's not quite GPT-3 scale, but 12 billion parameters is still a pretty massive model. So it's pre-trained on 159 gigabytes of GitHub data. Later in the video, we'll take apart exactly how big 159 gigabytes of uh, you know code data really is. Uh, it's additionally fine-tuned on these interview style problems and continuous integration tests but again this fine-tuning is more like a domain supervision because it's still doing this uh, likelihood minimization with this uh, sequence to sequence generation task so it's still trying to uh, you know autoregressively go left to right and predict the correct uh, token that's been masked out always at the rightmost part of the sequence but now the domain is more interview style uh, problems in these tests which are better aligned for then evaluating it on say the apps benchmark or this human eval custom data set so they uh, construct a custom data set it's not really that big it's 164 examples with an average of eight about eight uh, test cases so it's not really a massive data set but they use this to evaluate the model and then you know report the when they're reporting the percentage pass this is what they're talking about uh, they compare it with previous GPT models, like how well GPT-3 would do its transfer into this, as well as the Eleuther AI GPT Neo model, and then also the Tab9 autocomplete tool. And then the big uh, takeaway from this is using repeated sampling to get better results. So instead of just doing one greedy decoding of the generation tree, you can sample, say, 100 of these with you know, different values for the temperature and you know, how you traverse the tree. And this really helps and is really useful for, say, code, where you have this ground truth evaluation. Does it pass the unit test? Compared to where to say uh, text generation, if you just do all these different samples, you now just have a bunch of samples and it's hard to really pick which one, you know, you pick which one through something like greedy decoding, or as it describes say the mean log probability of the traverse through the tree, and these different ideas. So repeated sampling works particularly well for this application setting where you're trying to pass these unit tests. So you have this kind of like ground truth evaluation of different generations. So evaluating the output of these kind of esoteric domains like image generation and text generation is an active area of research. It's hard to say that uh, you know, this style GAN model versus the big GAN self-attention GAN, you know, this, these generated images are much better because you don't have this kind of automated metric. And again, there's a lot of research that does this and it's different from passing these unit tests, which we'll talk about more later in the video. So if you're curious about what these programming problems look like, here's a quick image that shows exactly the programming style problems, the code that the model is being trained to generate. So say you have the function signature increment the list, it takes in as an input argument a list, then you have this doc string, in this case providing uh, examples of what the function is supposed to do. So return list with elements incremented by one, showing that if you pass in as this list argument one, two, three, it turns it into two, three, four, then another function def solution list. So you get nothing from the fun function signature in this case, but the doc string is telling you what the, what that you're supposed to implement in the resulting Python code. So the model will learn to generate these functions that satisfy these doc strings and so on and then when you have these test cases you give it the function signature the doc string and then you you know it generates the code and then you have these unit tests 
to evaluate, say, the edge cases, the average cases, and these kind of like leap code, hacker rank style evaluations of these uh, algorithms. So as a little bit of a background on deep learning with code data, there are these different papers that are exploring using code and programming languages as the data set for these tasks. So uh, CodeBird is also doing this kind of uh, like Electra style language modeling with say Java, JavaScript, Python code. Codex Glue is a collection of say, what kind of supervised learning tasks, similar to the Glue benchmark that said we have text classification, natural language inference, duplicate question detection, trying to unify all these different supervised learning tasks we can think of in the natural language domain Codex Glue is trying to do that with code and also uh, going bridging these domains between text code, code only, text only. So, you know, integrating, say, natural language descriptions of code with the doc strings and so on with these kind of tasks we can do with code data. And then uh, just a recent paper, I'm trying to select more of these in the weekly update videos. Break it, fix it is looking at this algorithm that could fix semantic errors with your code. So instead of having to take that frustrating debugging error and paste it into Google, potentially solutions that could you know, fix your code for you and pass it through the compiler. So really an interesting domain, accelerating really quickly and should be this really interesting kind of augmented intelligence meta tool for deep learning researchers and programmers that help with the, these kind of workflows and these kind of problems. So the bigger trend at play here is the success of language or sequence modeling. So we've seen things like GPT-3 with 175 billion parameters that are trained on these large text data sets, like all of Wikipedia, a bunch of books, scientific papers, or you know GitHub is the data source. And it's trying to predict the masked out token at the end of the sequence. So I'm going for a walk outside to get some fresh and then say predict air compared to a vocabulary distribution that could include uh, like tiger or zoo or car, whatever. There could be this big vocabulary distribution that has to predict the masked out token. And you do that at a massive scale. The data can automatically label itself as in self-supervised learning. And it's proven to work really well. So they're scaling this up to other domains. There's a huge research interest in deep learning, taking this to code, image pixels, amino acids, moving this idea of this sequence modeling task into other problems. So transformers is universal computation engines. is looking at how well these pre-trained transformers can do image classification, just you know treating the pixels as a sequence of data. Same with the image GPT model. It's not quite uh, state of the art doing this technique yet with image generation just going autoregressively left to right, but it's very interesting and especially for code amino acids and so on. So the decision transformer is another really exciting paper that shows say when you have these reinforcement learning problems, you also have the sequence problem. Uh, reinforced learning, you're predicting a set of actions given a set of input states. And you can also look at this as a sequence learning modeling problem, where you maybe have more of the sparse reward as in the reinforcement learning setting. But they show how, you know, the transformer, this sequence modeling approach by modeling this, you know, sequence of state action trajectories into some reward is a really successful framework. So we have these data sets, it's really easy to get a massive amount of text data. Uh, GitHub data, a data set from Eleuther AI, the pile. It also uh, includes a percentage of GitHub and Stack Overflow data. And as they mentioned in their, uh, in their paper describing the GitHub data set that's used to train Codex, there are more than 10 public repositories containing solutions to the code forces problems. These are the apps benchmarks. This is why they have to uh, construct this human eval benchmark and they can't just report apps because they've seen that data in the training set. So this article will be linked in the Notion page of this overall AI Weekly Update series. This is a blog post from Hugging Face showing you how to train a new language model from scratch using transformers and tokenizers, referring to the Hugging Face transformers and Hugging Face tokenizers library. So with this tutorial, uh, you can train a custom tokenizer for whatever, uh, say you have a distribution mismatch, particularly in the code setting, you have this different uh, save you encode white space as they describe later in the paper. This is you know super inefficient and so on. So this blog post, I highly recommend it if you want to play around with these language models with any kind of sequence data domain and use the Hugging Face library to deal with this. So once we've trained these uh, autoregressive text generation models, we need some way of evaluating them. And it's hard to evaluate these text or image generation models. So say you have a text model like a chatbot or something that writes like a story or a poem or something, it's hard to have just like this concrete evaluation like you have with these unit tests. So with code generation, you have these unit tests. And I think that's a really interesting and exciting component of this because it's difficult to automatically evaluate text or image generation compared to these unit tests. So in order to do that, the authors manually construct this data set human eval that is linked in this GitHub repository that has 164 programming problems with a function signature, a doc string, and a body for the ground truth uh, function implementation, and then an average of 7.7 .7 test cases per problem. And this is used to evaluate the different uh, code generation models. So then another interesting detail of you know, how they're overall constructing these experiments is they have this sandbox environment where they can execute the model generated code and they describe how they use this to you know, avoid these uh, 
programs that could kind of hack the open AI system and extract data, you know, all these different ideas. And they use this G-Visor uh, container runtime, maybe an interesting detail for someone looking to experiment with this and, you know, have these runtimes, say you're doing, you know, supervise, maybe you have like a reinforced learning environment where it has this sparse signal and you need these kind of sandboxes to execute code. A very interesting idea of thinking about how these experiments are designed in a really controlled setting for experimenting with these kinds of models. The key technical novelty behind this codex paper is this idea of repeated sampling. And again, this works so well because you have this concrete unit test evaluation. So you can generate a hundred different samples and then just filter them based on the ones that pass the unit test. So when you have language generation or you have this kind of you know probabilistic model that is filling out the mass token in the sequence, it has these different probability densities on different continuations of the sequence. So in this example, he is given 60% probability, grade 20% and influence 20% as a continuation of the sequence that ended with practice comma mask. And in practice, this would be the whole entire uh, cardinality of the vocabulary. So you'd have 30,000 or 50,000 to 55,000 different tokens, and the top three wouldn't sum to one. You'd have a little bit of density on almost all the tokens, even if it's like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. So you'd have this massive tree, and then you expand it so on based on the most, prob the most probability token. So as you go deeper into the tree, you might end up running into this high entropy kind of random distribution compared to just having these high confidence predictions throughout. So even if it's initially really confident on he, then it might have more, you know, entropy later on. It's not quite shown in this example, but as you imagine these different traversals of these different continuations. So the idea behind repeated sampling is to use these different uh, temperatures, uh, P parameters in order to have all these different decodings of these generation trees and then return the top 100, say, and see how many of these uh, traversals, say, you know, 5, 50, 100, 500, that you need in order to get a winning solution for these, for passing these unit tests. If you're interested in digging further into these details, the authors cite this nucleus sampling technique cited in the paper, The Curious Case of Neural Text Degeneration. I'm not going to discuss this in the video, but here's the paper that describes the difference between, say, beam search, pure sampling, uh, top case sampling, and this nucleus sampling technique. So concretely, the repeated sampling technique achieves a huge gain. So you go from 28.8% just sampling, say, whatever is initially returned, or if you use a heuristic, this is also not the same model, this is the fine-tuned model that we'll discuss later, but if you use heuristics like highest mean log probability as you traverse through the tree, log probability, you know, take the average of these different probabilities compared to, say, summing them up or other strategies like that, that would achieve 44% compared to 70% not fine-tuned in the fine-tuned, this corresponding model is about 78%. So this is the gain that's achieved, a huge gain, by doing this repeated sampling. And so then they describe this kind of intuitive motivation of saying that real-world programming tasks often involve iterations of approaches and bug fixes, which is approximated by generating many samples from our model and selecting one that passes all the unit tests. So I guess it's kind of uh, thinking about when you, you know, sit down to write something and you initially come up with some sentence and then you have another one and so on. This kind of idea is not exactly analogous to how we think, but you know, it's an interesting idea of thinking about how we could have these repeated generations for refining the prediction. So that brings us into the pass at K metric. So similar to say information retrieval where you're seeing how many documents you need to retrieve to retrieve the ground truth uh, rank label or something like that. How many K code samples do you need to generate to solve the problem? And they further use this N choose K strategy for uh, accounting for the variance of this, but I, I didn't really understand it from the description, but if you're interested, they do a little more detail about how they have this kind of uh, way of calculating the passive K metric. So to backtrack a little bit, let's look at how they collected the data for the initial pre-training as well as the fine-tuning of the fine-tuning models with more domain relevant interview style programming problem and continuous integration test data set. So the data collection, they have a May 2020 snapshot of GitHub where they extract 179 gigabytes of Python files and then they filter it to 159 gigabytes. And this is across 54 million public software repositories. So massive scale of data, 54 million public software repositories. So to kind of ask a little bit about how big is 159 gigabytes of code data, later in this weekly update series, we'll look at the Keras code example, uh, time series classification with a transformer model. And so if you go look at this Keras code example, and then you take all that text, including the code, and you put it on a text file, that'd be 34 kilobytes of data. So imagine having 4.7 million files of that size, the scale of data we're talking about with this pre-training of the codex model. So also if you take all the code from React, the React library from Facebook, the JavaScript framework, if you do git clone and have all the code, that would be 20.2 megabytes. So it's like having 7,000, basically let's call it 8,000 times the React library for potential code data to learn from the language modeling task. So language modeling has a ton of data. That's a big reason why this is so successful. 
you have so much data for deep learning and deep learning generally thrives on uh, big data. So it's very interesting to see, you know, the scale of 159 gigabytes and think about just how much data that really is. So in addition to the raw GitHub Python file scrape, they also have this fine tuning data they use to further guide the model to, towards this narrower distribution of these code style problems. So you have 10,000 problems from competitive programming contests and uh, websites like Code Forces and so on where you get these data sets. And then they have 40,000 continuous integration tests from the GitHub repositories. So they describe how uh, you know, Python has these continuous integration tools like Travis uh, CI for continuous integration that they use to get this data for the unit testing. And so if you're interested further, here's a link to the Travis thing and the, this idea of continuous integration, how you might be able to get some data for how you uh, do these kind of unit test problems from this to fine tune these models. So it's, it's very similar to the pre-training setup. It's the same idea of you know minimizing the likelihood of the next token in the sequence, but it's more domain relevant. So you're narrowing the distribution of the data to better align it with the downstream evaluation of you know solving these programming style uh, questions. So the boost from doing this fine tuning is 28.8% to 37.7 with a single sample, 70 to 77 with 100 samples in the repeated sampling idea. So rather than starting training from scratch, the authors hypothesize that you could fine tune it from one of these GPT-3 checkpoints. So as they state, since Codex is evaluated on natural language prompts as in the doc strings or the, you know, the description of the programming, the interview style problem, we hypothesize that it would be beneficial to fine tune from the GPT-3 model family, which already contains strong natural language representations. But they find that this doesn't really improve the performance because the fine tuning data set is so large. So there's a distribution mismatch at the scale of 159 gigabytes of data. You don't need to do this fine tuning from the uh, you know whatever GPT-3 was trained on and they do describe that there's this tokenizer mismatch where GPT-3 is going to tokenize every white space token as a separate token and that's going to result in a massive amount of uh, blowing up the sequence length with code data because you have a lot of white space with the way that you format code. So they use this little modification that results in representing code with 30% fewer tokens. So then they also pivot to the task of doc string string duration where you have a signature and the solution and you want to generate some natural language description of the code. You want to have some you know language that describes what the code does. So the way they do this for fine tuning is they rearrange this data set. So instead of being function signature doc string reference solution, it's going to be function signature reference solution doc string. So as we saw the previous examples of exactly what these look like, uh, would be you know in, instead of having uh, this in the middle, this would be put at the end. And now this is the generation task that you use to fine tune the models to generate doc strings. And you know that that task, and it's hard to say whether this is harder than this or whatever, but you know, it does seem like it's multi-line, maybe a little bit different in the way that it's done or multi-line, I don't know. But anyways, it's interesting to see this kind of difference between doc string generation and then code generation. So here's the first table of results on this human eval data set, which again is 164 manually designed problems, each with about eight test cases. So they're comparing the uh, different scales of codex going from 12 million, 25 million, 300 million up to uh, 12 billion. The pass at K, this is our, how many uh, repeated generations are used in order to get the winning solution. And then comparing this with the GPT Neo models up to uh, 6 billion parameters, as well as the uh, commercial tab 9 uh, auto completion tool. So uh, they're showing that, you know, at 6 billion parameters, GPT uh, J with 6 billion parameters is at 27.74, whereas Codex with 2.5 billion is, you know, about double that. So. The GPTJ, uh, they describe their data set in the pile, uh, Eleuther AI researchers, and this has this does have some GitHub data, some Stack Overflow data, so it does have some code data. It's not like uh, no code data is in it, and but you know this Codex thing, bigger data, GitHub, and so on. Th these aren't even the fine-tuned models yet. These are the just trained on the 159 gigabytes of data, not the uh, programming problems and the continuous integration tests. So also in the trend of scaling up the model size, we've seen tons of these papers that are looking at the scaling laws and you know giving us some equation like this. We've seen it for you know neural scaling laws of these autoregressive language models, autoregressive generation, and so on, where you show that basically you increase it by 10x to kind of move along the uh, y-axis a little bit. So this is showing the power law scaling of increasing the size of the codex models from say you know, 100 million parameters to a billion parameters and so on. So if you want to play around with uh, the GBT Neo models, here is a demo hosted on uh, 6b.luther.ai. You can uh, put in whatever prompt you want, like, uh, you know, sort a bubble list with Python or, or, or bubble sort a list with Python or, you know, reverse a binary tree, whatever with these kind of, these are the kinds of programming problems that we're talking about. You can test around with these prompts if you want to, you know, play around with this model and see what it'll generate.
So here's a quick look at the GPT uh, Neo, the GPT J6 billion parameter uh, demo. If you give it something like write Python code to bubble sort a list, def bubble sort, and then you let it, you know, finish it, it'll do the correct style of Python uh, list. You know, it doesn't do like the indent thing. I don't know if it would have to do like new line and then tab and so on to, you know, simulate the Python syntax. But you see it has some understanding of looping through this list, doing some kind of comparison, then swapping the elements, the kind of bubble sort idea. It doesn't look to be like exactly correct with the way it sets up the range. And then you know there are more description as you keep generating with the model and keep going into the generation tree. So it's really interesting and fun to play around with this GPT-J uh, demo that makes it so you know anyone can get a sense of what's going on with these large scale language models. So in addition to the uh, manually constructed human eval data set with 164 examples, they also evaluated on the apps challenge. So the apps challenge, it's also from uh, Code Forces, these different uh, interview styles, introductory, not also human eval is not from that, but Anyways, so they have these different categories, introductory, interview, competition, the different uh, levels of difficulty of the challenges. And these are the uh, one-shot results of Codex, uh, Codex comparing it with the uh, raw and filtered pass. I'm not, I don't exactly remember why that is, but uh, you know, the pass had one, five, 100, 1,000 thing as you increase the number of samples generated. And then one-shot meaning that this hasn't been fine-tuned yet and you're using some kind of demonstration of a uh, programming problem in the context window of the language model. So here's some more plots digging further into the results. Uh, this is where they're plotting the number of samples K and then the uh, temperature. Temperature is a hyperparameter on how they're sampling from the generation. Uh, looking at the optimal value to use for this temperature, uh, probably something to do with the way that you smooth out the logits where you have like the exponential of the logit divided by the temperature with respect to how you form that uh, probability distribution for the next token. Uh, this is showing the uh, pass rate versus the model size. Uh, showing an interesting thing about this plot is that they show that, you know, as you uh, are doing more uh, generations, so the pass at 100, now it benefits to have uh, a higher temperature parameter, so you have 0 0.8, which means it has more diverse solutions. And then this also continues to be the case as you increase the number of parameters to so say a higher capacity model knows how to do more diverse generations or knows it has it in the parameters of the model. And then, then the temperature thing is how you kind of probe for that. So then uh, simple ranking heuristics. So, you know, you're generating 100, 1,000 samples. How are you going to rank them? Uh, they use the doc string thing to use this back translation between the generated and original uh, doc string is one way of ranking this. Uh, when you do the mean log probability, this is where you, uh, you know, take the average of the probabilities as you go through the tree compared to, say, summing them up. Kind of surprising that, you know, the mean is performing so much better than summing them up. But and then just random selection for which one of the 100 generations are you know, given to the unit test and that kind of idea. So uh, this is also showing this problem with the blue score. This is a, one of the most interesting trends of this research, I, in my opinion, is that the, you know, you have this unit test ground truth evaluation thing compared to these other kind of heuristic evaluations they use. So blue score is like a matching metric. So you have this ground, say it's abstractive summarization and you have some kind of ground truth summary of a reference article. You'll, you'll measure the output of the model by how well it matches exactly the uh, ground truth thing. So when you use the exact ground truth of the reference uh, you know, programs, then you get a high overlapping score, but they might not have the same functional equivalence and so on and not pass the test. So they're showing that you know, higher blue score doesn't necessarily lead to you know, better unit test passing. It's just the fundamental problem of evaluating these text generation models automatically. And then this is showing, you know, again, the fine-tuned model, the Codex S is fine-tuned on the 10,000 programming problems, 40,000 continuous integration tests compared with the non-fine-tuned model. And then also looking at that same kind of trend, but with respect to model size, and then more on the ranking heuristics on how you can try to sample one without, um, you know, without having to just generate a thousand of them and so on. So they further do some uh, qualitative analysis of where the model is failing. They have these uh, artificially constructed tests where they chain together different things like uh, add these two numbers and then, you know, say you add three to Y and then you just kind of chain that over and over again and go say, then subtract four from Y, then multiply Y by eight. You, you do these long chain, chains and this is where the model will start to break down. And then it also shows that, you know, it breaks down with this idea of variable binding and being consistent with, uh, you know, using the variables to, you know, do these sequences of calculations as shown here. So as this idea of deep learning with code data and these artificial intelligence, deep neural network models that can write code, the OpenAI team has a really great uh, policy team that is kind of an analyzing the impact of what this uh, technology might do. In their broader impact statement, they describe the over-reliance as programmers may over-rely on these models and that kind of idea. Uh, misalignment, bias and representation, economic and labor market impacts, security implications, environmental impacts, legal implications. This, this has been a big one I've seen on Twitter where people are 
uh, like finding their code. It's not, you know, looking at the licenses of these public repositories and so on, and then risk mitigation. So I highly recommend checking out this paper as they, you know, think about the big impact of this kind of technology of deep learning that is, you know, writing code. So my opinion on this is I see it as an augmented intelligence. And I think generally it's easier to think about kind of optimizing and building on the work that we do, you know, as deep learning researchers. So kind of like building on these little tasks, I don't think Codex is going to be like coming up with scientific breakthroughs through its code or anything like that anytime soon. But I think having these tools, you know, overall it speeds up the workflow of deep learning scientists who, you know, come up with some idea and then need a implementation of it and so on. So I think generally it's just this like meta optimization. And I also have this kind of thesis thinking that it's easier to optimize a task that we're doing as we build these systems compared to say going into some domain like the biomedical domain or something like that, where we really have no idea what the, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day tasks kind of are compared to the deep learning tasks. And I think it'll be this kind of augmented intelligence and studying it within the meta tasks of producing deep learning research is a useful way to, to make progress on this. Thank you so much for watching this explanation of evaluating large language models trained on code. I think this is one of the most interesting application domains that have come out recently. And I hope from this video, you're able to get a sense of these ideas, like how they collected this data set, uh, the scaling up of these models, what they compare it to, how they evaluate it with the human eval and the apps benchmark. And this huge idea of evaluating code generation with these unit tests compared to say like blue matching scores or you know other ways of evaluating generations automatically. And then this idea of repeated sampling and so on. I think this is a really exciting application domain and I'm really excited to see you know, where this goes. Mm -hmm.